Yeah, and I will. I I, I think the other um, or one one of the other pieces of success we talked about. Uh, first of all, really cool to see a really really diverse group、mm-hmm. of participants, right? So like that that makes. Me think about the future of this field, and 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 think about you know who do we need leading us? What are the paradigms that they're coming with?、Um, what are the experiences they're coming with? But but the other side of that, I think, or I don't know if it's the other side, but a dimension of that is、um, you know really taking on、uh, you know identity centered leadership. Like what does that mean?、Mm-hmm. Hello and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host Keith Edwards. Today I'm joined by two folks who chaired NASPA's aspiring VPSA Institute. We're here to talk about paths to the VP role, what is required for the transition to and se- success in these roles, and lessons learned from these aspiring VPSAs. Thank you both for being here to share this with us. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and online learning community for thousands of us who work alongside, adjacent. Or in the field of higher education and student affairs, we release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find details about this episode or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. This episode, sponsored by Rutledge, Taylor and Francis, view their complete catalog of authoritative education titles at rutledge.com/education. This episode is also sponsored by Huron, a global professional services firm that collaborates with clients to put possible into practice. As I mentioned, I'm your host Keith Edwards. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a speaker, author, and coach, helping higher ed leaders and organizations advance leadership, learning, and equity. You can find about more about me at keithedwards.com. And I'm recording this today from my home in Minneapolis, Minnesota, at the intersections of the ancestral and current homelands of both the Dakota and the Ojibwe peoples. So. Uh, let's get to the conversation. Thank you both for being here. Let's learn a little bit about each of you. And Jose, we're going to have you go first. Yeah. Hi, Keith. Thanks for having me on, and、uh, excited to talk about this experience.、So、I'm Jose Riera, pronouns he, el, and、uh, I currently serve as a vice president for student life at the University of Delaware,、uh, where I've been since 2010. Not always in that role, in this role since about 2018.、Um, and I had the great, amazing fortune to、uh, co-direct the NASPA. Um, vice president, aspiring vice presidents institute with、uh, none other than Claire Brady. So I can talk more about myself as we go through the episode. But just thanks again for having me. Yeah, go ahead, Claire. Tell us about you. Hi everyone. Thank you, Jose.、Uh, thank you, Keith. So I'm Claire Brady. I have worked in higher education student affairs for 24 years now. I tease that I'm a recovering vice president of student affairs from Lake Sumter State College. One of the 28 community colleges in Florida, as well as Energy Mendez University,、uh, which is actually based in Puerto Rico, and I spent the last year or so working full time as a full time educational consultant. My company is called Glass Half Full Consulting, and I work a lot with student affairs leaders,、uh, college presidents, and about half my business is actually focused in the area of AI in higher education. So that's a big area of interest for me. And I had the great privilege of serving not only as a faculty member in 2022 with Jose, but、right. co-directing the institute in 2024, and we had a just a great experience. So thanks for having us to talk about it. Yeah, thank you both for being here.、Uh, interested in learning more. Just saw some of the buzz on social media and thought this seems juicy and energized and interesting. So、uh, happy to learn more about it. Uh, as you mentioned, you've been faculty, and then you co-chaired. As you were tapped, or volunteered, or voluntold, maybe you can tell us that story to co-chair this experience. I'm super curious. As you were going into it, what were some of the guiding approaches to planning this experience that you thought about for the participants? What were you sort of going in wanting to put into practice, put into motion for them? I was really interested in making sure we honored the fact that it was an institute and not a conference or some other type of professional experience that our participants could engage in.、Uh, for me, as the co-director, I'd had such a great experience in 2022 with our team, but it was coming out a different time out of the pandemic. We were in Florida. We were wearing masks.、Uh, we were we were socially distanced from one another, and even though it was a really positive experience, I. Kind Kind of wanted a redo.、Uh, 
um, at a later point. Uh, and I got that experience this time around being one of the co-directors. For me, it was about creating not only just a really special and transformative experience for the hundred or so participants, but I was also looking to fill my tank and to have a professional experience along with the faculty. So the relationships that we built as a team, the hard questions we asked each other, the ways that we engage with building the curriculum and choosing the participants and all of the stuff that goes into a, a four day experience like this. And honestly, I was also just really excited to work with Jose again. We had a really great experience co-presenting and being faculty before. We have vastly different skill sets and they're really complementary. We also have just a huge amount of trust and we like each other a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we laugh a lot. Um, <laughs> I teased that my belly hurt when I got back from this institute because there were just so many great moments alongside our faculty members. So for me, that was those were kind of the big 500 feet in the air goals that I had going into the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some something else that comes to mind for me um, you know, this wasn't about convincing these people to become vice presidents of student affairs, right? Um, I, I think um, in, in, in so many ways, we had so many conversations as a faculty, um, and, and, a, and, and we can come back to this in, in more depth as we talk, but this is a tough time in higher ed. It's a tough yeah. time in student affairs. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, I, I I feel like even since the institute, um, which was what like barely two ago. months ago now, yeah. yeah, a month ago basically. Um, I mean, you know, the way budget stuff, you just see that in the chronicle. And and I was just talking to my staff today. I don't feel like there, there there's no there's not many good stories on the cover of the Chronicle. It's like every day it's another constraint for higher ed or another challenge. And so um, I think, I think it was really trying to, you know, see where folks were at and, and honor like where they were in their yeah. careers and in this field. Right. And not saying you should do this or you should think this way or good VPs think this way, or they think that way. It's, it's, it's what has your experience been? Because I think part of, and if I can speak for you, Claire, because we had these conversations was, you know, like this next generation or whoever's coming into these positions, not only the VP positions, but into student affairs, like that is the solution for the issues that we're facing in higher yeah. ed. And, and if I were to apply my paradigms on that and say, this is the way you need to be, I think that's a disservice, right? To where to 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 where we're heading, and so um, so I think a big thing was was just try to sit with people where they are in their careers, um, and and honor that it's a tough decision for any of us to leave a job and go into a new job or whatever. And so we, I, I mean, all the more when you're thinking about a VP position, which you know. It, the reality is, is a lifestyle choice. It, it is mm -hmm. a decision you're making that pervades your life in, in really significant ways. And so really wanting to, to, I guess, make that a safe place that people can talk about. What are those things that they've wondered, like, seriously, like, do you all really do this? Or is this really <laughs> what it means? Or, or am I giving up, you know, X part of my life or whatever? And to yeah. ask those questions, because if they walk away there not being able to ask those questions, which you don't always feel safe to ask on your own campus, that would be that that would be a miss. I love this because I think it can be kind of about ego, right? It can be about yeah. me, me, yeah. me and uh, yep. ever since 20 years, I've aspired to this. And it sounds like you really wanted people to be grounded in the reality of do you really want to do this. Or, um, you know, I think a lot of my work with my coaching clients is helping them break free from the scripts they've been given, yes. which are the hardest when they're a compliment. Like you could be a VP. Oh, really? Great. And then you kind of take that <laughs> yeah. on and having right. people really wrestle with the realities of higher education, the realities of moving institutions, moving families, you know, buying a home, <laughs> starting a new community and new friends, uh, the lifestyle choice, all of this and making sure that people are really have really thought it through and aren't just sort of following maybe a path that has been laid out before them, but making yeah. sure it's their path. And it sounds like you worked really hard to hold space for people to 
really pay attention to that real reality, really see what yeah. resonates with them, really connect. Is, is this right for me? And if so, <laughs> let's go about pursuing it. But that seems like a really critical yeah. first step. Well, I think too, like we spent 15 months or so developing the curriculum, but we had to be agile in the moment and recognize what was happening in the audience. And just what you just described, Keith, mm -hmm. is exactly what happened the first day. We found so many of the participants talking to us about either how do I fit myself into this mold that I've created, this script that I've created yeah. in my mind because I've only ever known three vice presidents mm -hmm. and they all looked like this, dressed like this, spoke like this were perfect. There was this mm. whole like perfect thing that was going on that we just, we, we squashed that immediately. Right. Oh, good. Um, just by our own <laughs> behaviors, but uh, really it's this idea that like they have this image in their mind and these are, these are qualified seasoned professionals, yeah. but this is what our field does a lot of times, right? You only have one person who sits in this seat at any given time at an mm -hmm. institution. And so they kind of base that mental model on that person. The second thing they did was they were trying to game how to get there. Mm -hmm. What do I need to like shine and polish mm -hmm. in a way so that you don't pay attention to all this other stuff that I don't think I fit this mold, right? Mm -hmm. And so we recognized that the first day and we immediately started messaging as a faculty in our small groups, in the large group, in our sessions, that there are multiple pathways to this role. Mm -hmm. There are various ways to do this role. There is not one successful template that you need to follow. But that institutional fit is a big part of that. Who your boss is, who your board is, those are all huge pieces of that. Do you really align to the mission? Because the mission looks different at a community college than perhaps another type of institution, right? And in that, our, our, our faculty really kind of hit all those various areas. More than half the faculty had been vice presidents at two different institutions. Mm. That brings a wealth because you make a lot of mistakes the first yeah. time and you do things really differently the second time, right? A lot of our folks had chosen institutions very intentionally or had different pathways, didn't have a doctorate, chose to go the MBA route instead, yeah. had chosen to be affiliated with Jesuit institutions their whole careers, had chosen to go small private or has chosen to go community college. And in just our physical being and the ways that we showed up at the table, I felt like that messaged immediately to the participants. There's no one way. There's yeah. no one way. But you can't game yourself to this role either. You have to have some requisite skills, right? You have to have the ability to fit into that cabinet. And we started to immediately be agile and change the way that we looked at the curriculum and we saw immediate effect. Mm -hmm. And that I think was a big part of us spending so much time together over the 15 months previous, kind of being willing to put a curriculum together, but also seeing that we're seasoned enough that we can kind of play with it. So yeah. that was a huge piece for us in that first day, especially. Yeah, and a good plan allows you to improvise. Yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. Um, well, I love that you began, or may, maybe you didn't begin, but maybe the first step <laughs> that you invited people into, and I hear you're holding space for this. Is this right for me? Is this really what I want? Is this really, mm -hmm. given all the things that come with it? Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I, I'm imagining that a lot of this was about how do you make the transition and not to game mm -hmm. the system, but do so genuinely and authentically. And how can you be successful in these roles? What do you, what emerged for the two of you through the planning the Institute, the faculty, the participants, I'm imagining they're, you're thinking about this has evolved. Yeah, for sure. I, 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 I think um, there, there, there's so many things here. I, I, I do think it starts all the way back in the pathways conversation, right? The, the, the classic, um, kind of residence life, maybe student conduct, dean you know, of students kind of pathway. And, Sounds familiar, and it? it's, yeah, it does sound familiar, right? <laughs> uh, and, um, but, but I think, you know, one thing we took note of, uh, there was a subgroup of us in the faculty that um, looked at all the applications and, and uh, there was this disproportionate number of folks coming through like trio programs mm. that were interested in the VP position. And, 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 it, it, you know, you started receiving the applications, looking at them, looking at them, and then you start to see these trends and how fitting, you know, I mean, like, mm. what are we struggling with? It's, it's student success. It's, it's, it's retention, it's access, it's mm -hmm. social mobility, you know? So, so I think 
one of the things here is is that that was encouraging to me um and and i think we really try to empower people to think about you know you can be this or you can carve your path to this um but then there are realities to that transition and to your success and so it's not to say that you have to have a certain pathway and it's not to say you have to do the job a certain way but there are expectations at the end of the day and there are relationships you have to make in order to be successful. And so I think um, one of those pieces is I think about the transition, um, you know, and Claire touched on this. We, 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 I think a lot of what emerged was around um, institutional makeup and, and, and what is that institutional makeup? Um, I, I think a lot of, I heard a lot of, well, aren't you really, taking the job for the president. Um, mm. and, and we had a lot of conversation about that. And, and you know, my own personal experience, like, like that's, yes, there, there's some truth to that. And yet like presidents, I mean, their, their average tenure just keeps going down and yeah. down and down. And so unless, I mean, if you're in a place in life where you're willing to pack your bags at any moment and move to the next place, that's great. Um, but not everybody's looking for that type of lifestyle. So you do really need to look at what's the culture of the institution. And often the culture is bigger than that one person, right? Those are those lasting things that sometimes people on campus can't even name, but but they're there and they, they matter. They affect what's expected of you as a senior leader. Um, and so so we talked a lot about how do you suss that out? Um, how do you talk to folks about that? Um, even, you know, I think people at, at that, that may be at this stage often are folks that haven't worked with search firms. And, and I think search firms are great. They're awesome partners. I have lots of colleagues who are, who are search firm folks. Um, but they also make you feel like you're really special. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's part of their job, right? But it's not like you have to give up your entire identity or, or what your interests are in a job or, or what the conditions are for you to do well. So how do you think about that? And as a first time VP, where I think you probably feel very vulnerable, like you're taking this job and you almost feel like, oh my gosh, I'm lucky if I get it. Um, and so I think some of what emerges is, is how do you have that conversation and and how do you remember that at the end of the day, you know, search firms are working for the university. They're not working mm-hmm. for you. Yeah. They're working for the institution. I mean, we hire them all the time, right, to work for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's good. And so so thinking about some of those basic things in that pipeline. Uh, but I would say, and Claire, you, you can maybe pick up here. I mean, we talked lots about once you're seated um and and i think uh, i'm thinking about that that uh the session we had with um with president lewis from clayton state really thinking about this uh this very i i think an important shift when you're a vp which is yes your team your leadership team of a division of student affairs is vitally important but your first team becomes the cabinet and mm-hmm. and what and that's a big shift for people and that's hard particularly in a profession where our identity is so strong. I mean, we're, we're student affairs folks. And now all of a sudden you're saying, you know, kind of my best friend has to be a VP of research or a provost or a VP of facilities who may or may not really understand what I do. (laughs) Yeah. Well, before we go to Claire, I just got to say, I love this point about presidents. One of my favorite signs in my neighborhood on my little walking route is a sign that says presidents are temporary. Wu-Tang is forever. And yes, that's funny. My next door neighbor has that. Stuff. Yeah, I I love it, and I think they meant it politically. But I think about it all the time. Yes. Sort of university presidents and leaders, and as so many people huh. uh, struggle with that, these things are these things shift and change all the time. Thanks for letting me get in that end. Go ahead, Claire. Pick that. up where we left off. I love that. I love well, that. And I think too, like the purpose of the institute is 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 really unique in even NASPA's kind of group of institutes, right? It's not saying this is the institute that's going to prepare you to be a vice president tomorrow. Although I think that there are, we know already that there are participants that were there with us a month ago that are finalists in searches right now, mm-hmm. right? But if you imagine that we had probably twice as many people apply as we had spots. Mm-hmm. Um, because we wanted to keep the institute to a certain size to make How it. Big as is it? How many spots do you have? 
we we ended up mm. accepting in the 90s mm. um but we had about double that in terms of applications right, right? So about 90 so, participants and how many faculty seven so our okay. groups yeah. ranged like 12 to 13 which is already pretty big right yeah. Yeah. um and so for us the institute had to fit a lot of people that were at various stages. So for some, it's the next role, but for others, it might be the next, next, or even right. next role, right? So we had a lot of really big conversations about values alignment. We had some great conversations about identity conscious leadership. We had some really great conversations around cabinet as your first team, as Jose said, what does a president expect from a VPSA that's different than they might expect from other cabinet members? We talked about fundraising. We talked about working with donors and mm. going to football games when you don't want to sometimes. And the lifestyle component of when do you integrate your family and when don't, right? How do you find that connection to the institution without kind of giving up all your personal time? Mm -hmm. And we shocked them because most of us said, we're home by 530. Mm. And I think that they have seen some pretty egregious examples of folks who have very bad work-life integration, right? And so we shocked them in a lot of ways. And we said, uh, Melissa, Melissa Shivers from the Ohio State University has a very specific calendar. She shared her calendar with everybody. This is a major Big Ten institution, a major senior VP. And everybody was like writing down her schedule, even the faculty mm -hmm. were, because they were so <laughs> impressed with how well she's kind of scheduled out her days, right? And so- it was really interesting because we have to try to have a curriculum that kind of meets everybody along that spectrum, but we have to ask the big questions because we're also okay at the end of the Institute. If somebody says, this job is so not for me, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I want to be a the success. Best number if that's two. true for them, mm -hmm. that is a success mm -hmm. to get there. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot that's that for many people, that can be a radical thought. Huge. Yep. And in our last Institute in 2022, we had a couple of folks that were like, I want to go into the wellness space or I want to mm. go into the counseling space or I actually want to use my master's degree in social work instead of this. And again, that's a win for us, right? Yeah. Because it yeah. isn't a job for everybody and it may not be the job for you in this exact season you're in, yeah. but it may be the next season. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, I think about, um, you know, we had a, a number of folks who uh, maybe were seated in that kind of traditional number two role uh, who come out of this experience and said, I, I want to dedicate myself to being a really good number two. Like, like I, yeah. I understand the VP position from a different perspective now, and I'm understanding how valuable that solid number two is to the VP. And like, what a gift, right? Like mm -hmm. I think about my own experience and how important the people who are right around me are mm -hmm. to, you know, my ability to advocate for students every day and to build this agenda and to help our cabinet understand students and the centrality of the student experience, the university experience. Uh, so I, I, that's a huge one for me. Yeah. yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Well, but on the flip side of that, Jose, we also had folks that said, I didn't think it was for me right now because I have kids, but I'm seeing these mm -hmm. faculty members yep. who are talking yep. about going to their kids play and never mm -hmm. missing a practice. Yeah. I didn't think that was possible until somebody else showed me a different way that they do it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that can change, right? I, yeah. I might want to yeah. be, I've decided to be a number two. And then three years later, you go, yeah, I, I'm different now, right? We're all growing and we're all totally. changing. We're all totally. emerging. Yeah. Um, but I think that opportunity to think, reflect, discern yeah. is really, really possible. Anything else that you see um, that you might want to share with folks around the, the transition or success in the role? I Well, one, one thing that just popped into my head, Keith, is, is I think... Uh, in terms of preparation for the role, you know, I think sometimes the instinct is what learning opportunities and 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 when we define that, we think of like going to an institute or or taking a different professional development course or whatever, are there available? And and obviously that has its place. One of the things though that emerged um is that both, you know, prior to the VP, but being successful in the VP role like the primary professional development opportunity is the job, right? Mm. Like, and, and, and making sense of what it is that you're learning being, you know, reflective as you go through. Um, so, you know, we talked a lot and I think you'll resonate with this certainly um, about the role of coaching mm -hmm. um, and in, 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 you know, in the course of a leadership position like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think for some people, 
I, I think coaching is starting to really hit like the whole higher ed scene. And, 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 you know, we are often a few years or a few decades behind like corporate America or whatever in terms of this stuff. But, but so there was a lot of interest in, and many of the faculty are in active coaching relationships and, or we are also um, actively kind of stewarding coaching relationships with our leadership teams mm -hmm. um, or facilitating peer coaching that's happening mm -hmm. on our campuses. Um, and so some of the successes is, is you're, you, you know, you're never going to be prepared. And no. as you transition that you can step into this role and be like, okay, I have all my ducks in a row. No. Things are going to throw you um, and things are going to emerge that you need to know about or learn that you had no idea. Like they're so complex. They're under the surface. Uh, and let's face it. I mean, my president is not orienting me to this job. He's not telling me these are the things you need to know. He's giving me expectations, signals. I have to be yeah. listening and looking and observing and talking to my colleagues. Um, and so how do you learn on the job? Um, how do you deal with some of the issues like loneliness, we talked about that, like mm -hmm. as you get to this point, so success in the role means being okay knowing that you at certain points are gonna be in your office and question who can I trust with this information or who can I reflect this information with? Uh, one of our faculty, uh, and I love this, um, Alan Sturdivant from Seattle University mm -hmm. talked about kind of having this team of people around him. Uh, and if I'm remembering, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Claire, but it was a, a therapist, um, a pastor, and, and coach. a mentor, right? A mentor coach. Yeah. Um, and 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 that, you know, he's had these deep relationships with these folks. They played different roles at different stages of his development, pre him being a VP and while he's a VP. Um, but but again, it, it, it you know, what's our network around us and how are we paying attention to who's who's pouring into us and 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 who we're looking to to pour into us yeah well, and in that moment that i'm oh, sorry in that moment keith that that alvin told us that story mm -hmm. it had a huge impact on us i met mm -hmm. with a, yeah. i met with a participant yesterday and he said that for him as a as a person as a, a male identifying person in the room that he had had multiple conversations with men of color in the room that was the seminal moment in the mm -hmm. institute for them Mm -hmm. so. And I think the fact that it's an institute and we can tell stories yeah. different than these kind of formal presentations that you would see more at a conference allows for folks to truly kind of be authentic and really share. And that, you know, he probably shared that on the third day, Jose, mm -hmm. yeah. but like it yeah. stopped the audience, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. big. I think that's great. As someone who's coached a lot of hired leaders, including VPs and, uh, and presidents, it, it's a really unique thing when you're the leader which I think VPs yeah. are and presidents are, it, it gets really lonely. I remember yeah. watching the president of McAllister College walk around the faculty and staff social, like no one would talk to him. Oh, <laughs> like it was just, I just felt yeah. so bad. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I'm not going to yeah. talk to him because it's an yeah. intimidating thing. What are you going to say? What if you get it yeah. wrong? Yeah. It's such yeah. a lonely thing. And I think um, one of the ways I talk about coaching is um, helping you find your rudder and keep mm. your rudder. Because I think there's so yeah. many things mm. that say, can blow you off course and be like you're you're thinking about the wrong thing you're paying attention to the wrong thing yeah. you're on an island you disagree with the entire cabinet what is wrong with you and have someone say no that's really critical and they need your voice yeah. and just to kind of have that unequivocal on your side i mean i coach a lot of college presidents i have no idea how to be a college president but that's sure. not what coaching is coaching is helping that person figure out how they be at their best and i think jose you're pointing to self-reflection and meaning making like this thing happened yeah. who can i talk to about it and a lot of times as a vp you can't talk to anybody about it yeah. right because yeah. of confidentiality yeah. or it's between you and the president yeah. and that didn't go well but you can't talk about it with the other cabinet and her and so having yeah. someone and i love pastor is a good example therapist is a good example coach is a good example mentor is a good example having people who can just be on just on your side on your side yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I will. I I think the other um, or one one of the other pieces of success we talked about. Um, first of all, really cool to see a really really diverse group mm -hmm. of participants, right? So like that that makes 
me think about the future of this field and 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 think about you know who do we need leading us what are the paradigms that they're coming with um what are the experiences they're coming with but but the other side of that i think or i don't know if it's the other side but a dimension of that is um you know really taking on uh you know identity centered leadership like what does that mm-hmm. mean and 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 that was a piece of success we talked about you know that that again knowing yourself um knowing you know what's important to you and what what does it mean that you're being true to who you are and again when you think about institutions and institutional cultures and um are things jiving for you what happens when they're when you're in the job and you realize uh oh like there's a piece of the culture, a piece of the institution. I mean, you, you're not going to be able to assess every piece of it mm-hmm. right. um, when when you're in an interview process. And so uh, I feel like that was an area where we both talked about you know, how to be successful, how to prepare for that, how to move through that. But I also feel like the participants really resonated with that, wanted to talk mm-hmm. more deeply about that experience. Yeah. Great. I want to be a little bit more personal. So what did you two learn from the participants? You had these mm. 90 folks. What did you um what did you realize or know or <laughs> understand differently at the end of the institute uh than when the institute began? I mean, as you said, 15 months of planning, working with all these faculty, putting so much thought into it. What did the participants have to teach you? Clarity. Oh, so much. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm in a unique position, right? Because I'm not sitting in that seat anymore. I did it twice. Uh, I may go back. Who knows? Uh, you know, we all get kind of tapped on our shoulders from time to time. But for me, I, I two words kind of really just resonate for me, like hope and healing. I, I, mm. I just kept hearing that from the participants. Like it was probably, um, the most collegial engaged people weren't on their phones. We weren't on our phones. Mm. We saw people interacting in between sessions. We saw groups going to dinner together. I just saw this, this community start of folks who will support each other for decades to come. You know, I I have this group of faculty that I'm now connected to for life, but they have this larger group that they can kind of lean on as well as they start to head into a lot of these roles, right? The healing part for me was that I felt like folks were coming in with these really absurd views sometimes of the role, almost like caricatures of the role, like the person was wearing armor and had no emotions and was perfect in every way. And I feel like we kind of smashed it in the best possible way, Mm -hmm. right? And they start to see themselves in the roles. In a way of like trying to place themselves in a role is different than seeing themselves being able to do the work. Oh, say that again. Say that again. Yeah. To me, it's like, it's not just about placing yourself of of like, do I have this checklist of things, right? It's this idea of like, I can see myself doing that work. I can see myself at the cabinet table. I can see myself in the community advocating for this institution. And I even want them to see themselves being faculty for this institute, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I think we kind of smashed a lot of preconceived notions um, in the best possible way. And I felt like people were really open to it, engaged with it, but so was the faculty. Like we were learning and growing as we were going as well, right? And what we thought a year ago was gonna be like the most important thing we talked about wasn't the most important thing we talked about. Um, so I, I, I'm still learning from it. I'm still getting communication from the participants. I'm still posting jobs every day in our private LinkedIn group saying, here's a job you might want to apply for. I have looked at more resumes in the last month than I probably ever want to for the rest of my (laughs) career, right? Um, But they are motivated. And that's Mm -hmm. like the best possible feeling for for the amount of work that we put into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm working this this thought out. So so bear with me. But but it's it's about... a, a little bit about what you just said, Claire, and and then a little bit about community. I mean, I think one of the things, you know, as I would kind of try to stop and 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 step back as I was observing the institute happen, um, is, you know, we just I, I don't I, I mean, as much as we have ACPA and we have NASPA, um, it made me wonder, like like, man, this community is so important, and yeah. and. 
it seems like we don't do a great job on our campuses yeah. of like eliciting this community or facilitating this community. Or I don't know. It made me wonder, like, like people just seemed thirsty to connect and maybe it's yeah. the moment in time that we're in, you know, post COVID and people are still maybe getting back to things, but um, you know, people need some affirmation. They need support. They need a community of learning. Like how important is that? Um, and 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 we know there's inequities around even what campuses can support around professional development. Yeah. And so, um, and, and again, we had a diversity of folks from community colleges, um, from you know R ones and and everything in between. And and so it was it was wonderful to see that. Like there was something like really kind of inspirational. Um, I, I would say about just just seeing um the 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 community piece but but there is this other piece and and you were definitely like leaning into it claire around um you know who who's able to see themselves in this role as again as i step back and 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 looked at or listened to so so we had we had primarily three modalities of kind of learning throughout the institute right we had like large group sessions um we had uh, kind of mentoring groups. So each faculty member had 12 or 13 mm -hmm. um, um, participants that they worked with. And then we had these, um, I guess, were they called coaching sessions? Consultations, Why am I forgetting? yeah. They're co consultations, right? And so we introduced ourselves as like fully as we could on the first day. And the idea was if, if you're resonating with something, you know, so in my introduction, Keith, I said, you know, I'm a dad of, Four girls. I'm uh, I'm I'm in a dual higher ed. My wife's a faculty member, right? So like mm -hmm. like these different attributes of who I am, and then people came and signed up for a twenty minute consultation with me because they had too many kids, or because <laughs> they you know whatever like whatever it is, and so um and 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 so in those two you you got a little bit more personal, you know, and yeah. and, and they were really asking advice. Sometimes they were bringing their materials, um, but this idea of helping them, um, I guess, chart a course where, yeah. you know, some of us are really fortunate and I feel like I've always been blessed to have uh, some really great mentors and supervisors around us who are looking for that next opportunity for you, you know, who are who are saying not only career wise, but professional development wise or or that committee that you can serve mm -hmm. on and you realize not everybody has that, right? And so this was kind of an environment where everybody was for everybody and it was just trying to like like help people. And so in the midst of that learning, like the power of a learning community and, and you know, how do we keep that alive? Um, and, then, and then the other piece with that is just the danger. Uh, and I hope this is starting to change. I don't know, but I feel like I grew up in an era of student affairs where VPs were kind of like elite and they were like this, mm. this separate class and again i was fortunate in my formative years to not be on campuses where that's how the vps that i saw were but but how important it is for us to really be making this accessible you know and yeah. that we need you know as a vice president what i learned is as i'm working or moving through regional and national learning communities in this field of, of stopping and taking that time to be in relationship with folks that are, I'm just starting to explore, you might know more about this, Keith, but there's um, this concept of, and I'm trying to see if I'll be courageous enough to try it, um, of like, it's, I think it's called like reverse mentoring, where you mm -hmm. actually find somebody, quote unquote, lower in the organization mm -hmm. to mentor you. Um, but, but this idea of listening to who's, who, who's, coming up i mean everybody sees things differently yeah. from their lens and and it was really cool to kind of have the time off of my campus to be able to listen to people who see our jobs or see the field differently than i see because that's my you know i have this little right. echo chamber i talk to vps that's who i talk to right right <laughs> yeah. well and i think th that's the whole notion that leadership is not a position but a process yeah. And um, I find myself often reminding folks, particularly <clears throat> when I talk with with Artie's, for example, 
they sit around and say, you know, when I'm the VP, I'm going to do this. And when I'm a VP, I won't do this. And I don't know why our VP does this. And I don't know why our VP does that. And, blah, blah, blah. and they sit around and they, they just lament what the VP could be doing. And when I sit with VPs, you know what they say? Remember when I was an RD and what I did actually mattered and I met with students and now I'm just in meetings and budgets <laughs> and crises and blah, 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 and blah, blah. But that's when I can really make a difference, right? And so I think it's, both of those things are true, but how do we yeah. just not see when I'm in the VP role, then I'm a leader, but I get to lead now, I get to lead in different ways in this process. And I think that's where I think a lot of that reverse or intergenerational mentoring can be really powerful. Like, what do you know that I don't know? And, yeah. it can be and I would almost argue like the other areas within the university, like when we told them that our first team was the cabinet, they looked at us like, who are you? Mm -hmm. And we're like, no, they're great people. <laughs> They're, right. they're awesome. They're fun. I care about them. They love this university. They love yeah. our students. It just looks maybe a little different, yeah. but didn't they look at us like, oh, yeah, totally, totally, totally. Well, and the value of yeah. having people who really don't, who aren't student affairs people, right. who, who are right. research people or who are the CFO, yeah. who yep. have different backgrounds and different perspectives can be, um, it can create conflict, but it also can be really yeah. rich. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, Awesome. We are running out of time and, uh, and we always end with this question. So this is student affairs now. So we like to end with what you're thinking, troubling or pondering now. So just like to hear that from each of you might be related to our conversation today or things beyond that. And then if you want to share where folks can connect with you, that would be great as well. So Jose, I know that you like, you yeah. like to trouble. So what are you troubling now? I do, I do, I do like to trouble. I do like to trouble. Um, I, I, I mean, honestly, uh, if, if, if it was a first thoughts exercise, mm -hmm. uh, my, my immediate thought went to like our industry, right? And, yeah. and this, um, I mean, there, there just feels to be so many tensions right now around um, you know the the kind of financial constraints on our industry and and how do you um like it's not okay to ask people to do things uh you know above their skill set and not pay them like that's not okay it's not okay to um you know say well let's just add another program um and we just keep adding programs i was thinking about this from an academic perspective, and I know this is not 100% true, but by and large, we like add new academic programs. We don't take academic programs away. Like that's not something we do in higher ed. And, and so the sustainability of that, we're in one of these other cyclical periods. And I think, I think we are in a cycle, right? Like higher ed's been through many cycles. I don't think it's dying, um, but by any means, I think there's a lot of hope. But But how do we kind of capture this and think, or continue to think differently about the university, continue to think about um, this, this one experience. I got to visit with our undergraduate student government uh, last week. And, uh, and, you know, I was struck, like, I so often just subconsciously, I walk into the student center, and I think, this is a student life building. You know, no student thinks that. No student, no student walks into the student center and thinks, oh, this this somehow is under the vice president of student life. And then Good they job, walk into the library and say, this is under the provost, you know, like yeah, like yeah. it's it's. And so we do, um, you know, I think in our traditional auxiliary model, there is something to say. We like to have like ownership and property and that like and there's, you know, and I can kind of move the chessboard around because I get this money from student fees. And, you know, you're seeing more and more libraries and student centers being built together mm -hmm. uh, because the library is a student center. I mean, that's really, it's been, yeah. you know, our, our lack of dependence on books and things. And so, so I'm thinking about all of these things as a system, uh, but at the same time, access and equity and holding all those things in tension. Um, and, and can we do that? Like, can we figure this out and what's the way, uh, through this and so i don't i don't have answers but th those are some things i'm thinking about um but i you know i think you know me I, I love to think about these things it's it's really exciting um happy to talk more about it but where you can find me uh you can look me up and email me at my ud email address or on linkedin and my faculty will tell you 
uh, I think it was Melissa Shivers last told me, you're always about three days late on social media. What's going on with you? Uh, which is about what will happen. But I love talking to other other folks in the field and who are passionate about higher ed. So please but reach out. That's because you have your priorities. Correct. That's what that is. <laughs> that's what I would say, say, oh, I'm not on Twitter. It's so embarrassing. I'm like, it kind of sounds like you have your life together. Yeah. Uh, as someone who is on Twitter. And, yeah. Claire, how about you? What are you have, pondering, troubling, yeah. thinking now? Always. So I'm like Jose, I'm kind of a marinator, right? And I, I'm always looking for trends and things that we need to be thinking about in our field. I have one related to the Institute and one not related to the Institute. So the first one is this group of 90 plus people, I would hire every darn one of them, right? Mm -hmm. So they are incredible. And what I want to have is that they have jobs and places to go that are worthy of their greatness, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'm thrilled that their institutions invested in them and poured into them and sent them to these institutes. But what became very clear was that folks who are LGBTQ center directors, folks that are trio directors, folks mm -hmm. working at community colleges, folks working at technical colleges, don't see a pathway to yeah. vice presidencies at a lot of the institutions that we all know the names mm. of, right? That we all know the logos for. And they don't see themselves and they don't see themselves as viable candidates there. And I will tell you that working at a community college was even better training than Res Life was for mm. me, right? Like I've had both and I can tell you boot camp, right? Mm. Community college, doing every job you could imagine. A community college professional who's in a dean of students role could do an amazing job at an R1 as a VP of student affairs. So I think we have to become more imaginative, more creative about who we think about recruiting, that we're not just recruiting kind of these linear folks. Um, and I think we need to have a space and a place and a field that is welcoming and is ready for this group of really talented folks who are going to disrupt mm. a lot of the tradition yep. That we, that we love, right? That we pour into. And so the second thing that I'm, I'm always thinking about right now is how these new technological changes are having huge impact on us. I spent last week with a corporate client in Nashville. They've had an AI work group task force for 24 months. Mm -hmm. They've had their policies in place for two years. They've adopted all kinds of efficiencies, free tools, all kinds of things that are helping them to do their job better. And I just think, we're focused on student success. We're focused on personalized learning experiences and making sure that teaching and learning stays at the forefront. We have to be more open to adopting technologies like AI that you know I love and adore, but I love and adore them because I see the possibility of what they could bring to our field, especially given the budget constraints, especially given the accountability measures put in place by so many of our states. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I live in Florida enough said, right? Um, so for me, it's this idea that like, there's this technology that's out there that we are just stuck talking about cheating and plagiarism. Yep. And we don't seem to be able to move beyond the fact that it could help us do all of the things that are mission critical to us. So that's what I'm noodling right now. Um, and my shout out for for how you can connect with me is uh, my website is drclairebrady.com. I'm also the moderator of a LinkedIn group group called AI in higher education. And I'm really finding a lot of community there. We're sharing a lot of resources. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn every day. And I do respond usually same day because I'm a consultant. So I don't have student meetings and campus that's, Zooms to go and to. And that's and your job. Right. That's my job. Yep. That is your job. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Well, thanks to you both. Thanks, this has just been terrific. I really appreciate you sharing your experience and what you learned from the participants. I think this is really rich. And thanks. Thanks for your leadership of the Institute and sharing Thank it you. with us. Uh, Thank thanks you. To our... Thanks for having us on. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks to our sponsors today too, uh, Rutledge and Huron. Rutledge, Taylor & Francis is the world's leading academic publisher in education, publishing a wide range of books, journals, and other resources for practitioners, faculty, administrators, and researchers. They've welcomed Stylus Publishing to their publishing program and are thrilled to enrich their offerings in higher education, teaching, student affairs, professional development, assessment, and more. Rutledge is a proud sponsor of Student Affairs Now. You can view the complete catalog at rutledge.com education. And Huron is a global professional services firm that collaborates with clients to put possible into practice by creating sound strategies, optimizing operations, accelerating digital transformation, and empowering businesses and their people to own their future. By embracing diverse perspectives, encouraging new ideas, and challenging the status quo, Huron creates sustainable results for the organizations they serve. 
As always, a huge shout out to our producer, Nat Ambrosi, who does all the behind the scenes work to make us look and sound good. And we love your support for these conversations. Uh, to connect with us more, you can subscribe to the podcast, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe to our weekly newsletter, where you get a reminder each Wednesday morning of our newest episode. And you can leave us a five-star review if you're so inclined. It really helps us have these great conversations reach more folks. I'm Keith Edwards. Thanks again to our fabulous guest today and to everyone who is watching and listening. Make it a great week. Thank you all.